sport involved, obviously, it's called Olympic weightlifting because it's in the Olympics. Something that me, uh, drew me to the sport was, one, it's a, it's a lot more fun way to work out, in my opinion, in the sense of like when I'm going to the gym, I'm, I'm going there for a purpose and I'm training. It's almost like going to practice as opposed to just going in to get my workout in. The beauty of the sport also is that you don't just have to focus on weightlifting. It directly applies to any other sport or athletic movement. You can do just explosiveness, power, all that stuff, which in applying it to this class with biomechanics and physics, definitely plays a role in how you most effectively move the barbell. The way physics and biomechanics apply, and what we get to do as a coach is watch him move and then get him to move um, better and more efficiently. So as a coach, what I'm looking at is, uh, does everyone know like, the fastest way to get from point A to point B, right, on this, like, this straight line, okay? So the easiest way that I can get a barbell from the ground overhead in one movement is going to be keeping that barbell and that bar path straight. So that's what I'm watching as a coach. Uh, you know, we see big rounding in the movement, and we know that we have some flaws in this technique. Biomechanics is how our forces apply to living, breathing creatures and what effect they have on those. Right? Okay, and if we're looking at angles and how the angle of the bar path goes here, not getting too technical, we want to keep that bar relatively straight as we go overhead. Um, this has to do with like angular displacement, um, your, your center of gravity. These are all cues and stuff that I'm looking at as he's lifting, which as you saw, the movement is pretty fast as it happens. So we take a lot of video of our athletes, we slow it down, we break down the movement part by part, and then we attack their weaknesses with a specific plan for them individually as far as where they're weak and what part of their body. <coughs> Ultimately, my goal is I want you to move well as a coach, and so I want, uh, I'm more focused on posture and position first. You can always add intensity, and that could be speed, weight, whatever we want to talk about as far as intensity. But I want to show, see that you can move properly first, and then we can always add on top of that at the end. My goal as a coach is to have people doing what they're doing when they're 16, 17, 18, when they're 45. Because if I can teach you how to move properly and move well, you can do that for the rest of your life. That's, for me, I'm the type of guy where like, if I can move through numbers, that's all great, but like, give, it, give me something to apply it to. And once I can apply it to actual movement, actual humans, now it makes sense to me, and now I'm excited about it. What does physics mean to you guys, right? Some of you guys, it feels like it's going over your head. Why do I need this? It's the generals. And we talk about all the time as coaches, we need to be master generalists to get really good at what we want to do if we want to kind of sprint team. And that's where physics meets bioenergetics. We do the analysis of a sprint. If we started with exiting the blocks or in football coming out of your stance or whatever that sport that may be attacking the ball in volleyball, attacking your opponent trying to drive the line in basketball. We're going to start with the start and the initial impulse for that first step. So we're specifically thinking angles, position, push, but exiting the blocks is a lot like jumping. Same impulses, it's a lot longer ground contact time, and we're looking for a horizontal displacement. So I think if you want to get really fast, really good out of the gate, you better be able to jump pretty far. Okay, so with sprinting, with acceleration, right, you're going to see an increased momentum. Your body angle starts at 45 degree angle, and depending on the athlete, you're going to kind of vertically rise, depending upon your strength levels, your acceleration, your maximal speed, um, and that's where it becomes kind of not only scientific, but there's an art in holding position here. So we're thinking with acceleration, it's forced from the ground in the proper direction. Again, body angle is going to kind of generally rise. If you're a younger athlete, it's going to rise faster. Usually females, females will rise a little bit faster as well. Um, longer ground contact times, and again, the rhythm of it, you're going to go really long. I teach my athletes, it's kind of like a boom, boom action. At top speed, it's kind of more of a pitter-patter action. A lot of you athletes will use hill sprints or sled sprints to increase your acceleration for that reason because of similar body positions, longer ground contact times, and you're overcoming your body weight. So uh, we know specifically with this one, if you're a heavier body weight athlete, that doesn't fly, right? That's not fast. So really important for our athletes to have a lower body comp and really pay attention. You see a sprinter in the air, like Carlos down below, um, the, the faster top end speed guys are going to cover a little more ground and get a little bit higher off the ground because they're producing so much force. So uh, we talked about that word higher ground reaction forces. The most powerful athletes can put four to five times their body weight into the ground, and that's why athletes that want to get faster usually strength train or the Olympic lifts as well. At top speed, we're looking at short ground contact times. Um, an elite sprinter can get their foot on and off the ground in 0.1 seconds. They're very elastic, they're very springy, very bouncy. So specifically with biomechanics, we're going to get vertical. You're going to see a high projection of the hips. You're going to see upright posture. You're 
you're going to see athletes that can really relax. So the fastest guys can really contract and relax at fast speeds. Classic example, you can see Justin Gatlin, we talked about earlier on, he's got great position here. Some of these guys, this guy on the right from Jamaica, his head is back, his hips are kind of falling through, he's not in the greatest position, he's probably striking the ground out in front of the center's mass a little bit. We always know that things will fall apart at the end, and usually with these races, the athlete that can hold technique the best at the end is usually be the one if he has a decent start. He has a basketball coach, back. that's my expertise, that's what we do. But we have a strength and conditioning coach who does a great job. He was actually, uh, he actually trains the special forces before he was with us in the Army, the Rangers. Um, so he's really about teaching, but he taught everybody from 18 to 40 years old. So he has to make sure he's able to relate to everybody and do things the right way throughout that. you got to have balance. If you don't have balance, you won't be able to do anything else. Explosiveness and athleticism, and you can all build that which way you want to go and however hard you want to work. How hard you work and making sure you have the right technique again is, is huge. Same with, if you go through with Mr. Muhammad, if you go in here and you're not doing the right, if, if you don't do it in the right order, something's going to happen in here that's going to go wrong. You can probably blow the room up. You, you have to know how to do it the right way. And the same with shooting, same with it's volleyball. Passing and catching, if, you have, if you're recruiting somebody and you're watching a kid and, they can run and jump out the gym, but they can't catch a ball. It's probably the thing that right made me fall in love with swimming was I got a coach about 10th grade year where he opened me up to the scientific side of swimming. And swimming is approximately 800 times denser than air. And swimming being 800 times density of water or air, you're just getting pushed back, pushed back, pushed back, can't do anything about it. So people were asking, why are we not going as fast, and why are we getting hurt so much? So in 1960, they developed a rule to where you couldn't, besides the dive, you couldn't submerge the top of your head. So acting up a force, getting acted upon, had just reduced right here. In this course of a year and a half, almost two years, the injuries were cut in half, the times decreased immensely. The re world records at the time, every single one in the span of three years was broken. Increase the drag, increase efficiency, and increase all momentum going forward. So when we got in here, we got to the point where we could submerge our head, we had, no, we had less drag, we had more efficiency. Our evolution through the sport, allowing these, the finding out the, the problems, really just, just lowering the head, first the whole head, then the top of the head, got rid of an, an immense amount of injuries, prevented injuries, and then it got the times faster as well. Now in about 2001, they started developing these suits. And these suits, they lifted and they compressed. So the more out of the water you got, you can take less strokes and move through the water. So the technology that's being dumped into swimming right now is doing a whole bunch of things to the sport. One, it's just making us faster, and two, it's simple. The cool thing with hockey is, with all the other sports that we we're talking about, uh, the one thing with hockey is now you're involving an implement. You're skating on about three millimeters of steel, okay? So three on each side of your foot. One thing we look at um, when we break down skating strides is that you, want, you don't want to have any, um, I guess, unused energy. So I can stand in front and just have somebody skate straight ahead and film them. And that way you're able to look at their arm movements, what are their legs doing, what's their, what's their arm doing with their stick, you know, are they swinging their arms to the side? It's just kind of, kind of like when you're running, but you need to be going straight ahead. And what are your, what are your legs doing? If you don't have speed, you can't play at a high level. So that's why it's so critical that you have a good, efficient stride in order to play at that next level, so you're increasing your speed. Every stick has a different flex to it. So there goes down from 55, 65, 75, 85, up to 105 with the NHL guys use. So the bigger you are, the stronger you are, the higher the flex is. So that's stiffer, than, the stick is stiffer than that, okay? So when you have a less stiff of a shaft, what happens is, is there's torque. So if I have a stick that's 105 pounds, I'm not going to be able to flex it. But if I have a 65 pound or a 65 flex stick, I can flex it and bend into my shot, and then I'm going to get more power on that shot, making it harder. And we're that really part with the performance enhancement program, so a little bit different from the athletic performance side. I'm more on the injury prevention and injury rehabilitation side. So for me, in the most general terms, physics is just the study of motion, but for me it's all about human motion. How does the human body move? 
in order for me to do my job, and for you, in order for you to kind of rehab back, I have to kind of get a diagnostic. I gotta get, I gotta collect some data on why this happened. Two most important variables that I use in my day-to-day -day life is force and velocity. Force and velocity have an inverse relationship, so they're opposite of each other. So think about a back squat, for example, like if you're squatting, right? As the weight and the load gets heavier, the velocity or speed will slow down. The real magic happens when we do force plate data or uh, velocity profile, or force velocity profiles. So, and you start from a standing position, and the line is to measure your force and velocity all at once. You would take off, and I would film it, and I can slow down the frames per second enough to where I can measure how much vertical displacement you have, so how high you get off the ground. So that app will provide me with a bunch of data that I can use for an athlete that may need to return to sport but not as quite ready. And what I can get is that force velocity profile. And if it says that it's not quite where I need it to be, um, just based on experience, and they want to get more explosive but they're not quite ready for it, I need to shift that mindset back to that graph. And we need to focus some stuff down here, so more like box jumps or drop jumps, which is probably even better than box jumps, and just speed, speed work, on the field work, um, learning how to decelerate, learning how to accelerate, learning how to cut. A lot of people talk about this stuff, but there's precision and movement that kind of goes neglected a lot of times.